Jane Eyre, and welcome to Rusted Junk, the 80s movie podcast. Do you dream about gremlins? How hard can you actually die? Does Barry Manilow know that you raid his wardrobe? If those mean something to you, then you're in the right place. This season, we're all about a dip into the 90s. So over to Charlie, Amanda, Joe and Dom for the film. Hello, welcome back to Trivia Time on Pulp Fiction, which is the podcast that we've covered. So hopefully you've just listened to that. If you really enjoyed that and the insightful commentary and the uh, tangents that we go off, that we normally go off in a podcast, it's great. What we wanted to do was split up the podcast so that we didn't have lots of trivia in that one. We talked more about the film and the, and the people in that and the relationships and then left the trivia for this bit. So I'm really glad that you've joined us. If you haven't listened to the podcast, and you've no intention of, please do, because it's really good. But if you just like this bit, and if you like the trivia, give us some feedback below. Um, you know, Let us know what you think of this, because we're trying out a new format for our regular listeners and viewers. Um, just Like just and let subscribe, us... people. Like and subscribe. Like, like, yeah, please do, because we really appreciate it. That's how we grow, and that's how we know that, you know, we get some nice messages now and again, and, you know, we see some of the stats, and we see how it grows, grows as well. So... It's, it's great for us, but just let us know that we're doing a good job. Even if you don't like me and, you know, I forget to put certain things in the podcast the other time, which does happen, um, you know, but but from a, I think we do an all right job. But if we could do better, please let us know. And if there's any films you want us to cover. So like and subscribe. Brilliant. Anyway, trivia right. on Pulp Fiction. So yeah. we've just given it um, spoiler alert. If you're listening to this first, why? But if you haven't listened to the main podcast, then we gave it a straight 40. It's the first 40 in Rusted Junk. It's the eighth season of Rusted Junk, and it got a 40. So I think there's plenty of juicy trivia to be had. And I think we're going to go around in order in that way. So, Dom, kick things off with a, an absolute <clears throat> banger of a well, trivia item. Oh, yeah, struck me silence in everybody. So for those of you who have listened to the pods in the right order, you'll know that I made some brilliantly astute points about the links between Reservoir Dogs and, and this film. Um, probably worth going back to re-listen to it again, just for those insights, if you, uh, if you, if you didn't quite pick up on them first time round. But one of the interesting uh, parallels between the two films is that um, John Travolta's character in this uh, is supposed to be the brother of Mr. Blonde, Vic Vega, played by Michael Madsen in, in Reservoir Dogs. Um, and Tarantino even had a spin-off film in development titled Double V Vega, which was the uh, prequel to both the movies about them when they were younger, which sadly and perhaps inevitably didn't make the light of day because they were both far too old to play younger versions of themselves by the time the idea materialised. But but I thought that's good. And, and if you look at the two films and consider the two characters, they're kind of both pretty... Yeah, I think it's plausible that they are brothers and drawn from the same family like that. So, yeah, that's my... That's my trivia. The link between the uh, Quentin Tarantino world of like Michael that. Madsen as Mr. It Bond. It's a good one to start off with because I knew about the brothers, but I didn't know about the TV series. Mm. Or, or the, sorry, the film, that, that, that we could, whatever they were going to do beforehand. Well, that's a great start. Joe, not that this is a case of topping the, the, the previous person that you've gone yeah, before. Yeah, because I've, yeah, I've gone big straight away. So I've, okay. I've, shot, right. I've shot my load already, Joe. So, um, yeah, <laughs> sloppy Delightful. seconds after this, I'm afraid. Mine will, be a long, <laughs> mine will be a longer load, actually. Um, mm. I'll try to go through it very quickly. Okay. So this is about casting. So originally, John Travolta was not the first choice to play Vincent Vega. It was actually Michael Madsen, and it makes me wonder mm. if he actually wanted him to play Vic Vega in, instead of, uh, you know, John Travolta as Vincent Vega. You know, it's possible that that's what he was going for, but he had to turn it down. He was, I forget what film. Oh, he's filming White Earp. Oh, uh, White Earp, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, Daniel Day-Lewis campaigned hardly to get the role, and Tarantino didn't want him. He just what? for some reason, yeah, it's like insanity. So the other actors that also auditioned were Alec Baldwin, James Gandolfini, Andy Garcia, Michael Keaton, Gary Oldman, Sean Penn, Dennis Quaid, Denzel Washington, and James Woods. All pretty wow. good, actually. Yeah, actually, the majority of them. Sean Penn would be interesting, but um, so Daniel Day Lewis bid strove to be Vincent yeah. Baker, yeah. 
I mean, that that would be incredible to see. I can't I can't imagine how it'd work, but he's obviously an incredibly talented actor, isn't oh, he? Oh, you could, I, I'm just I'm just viewing it, thinking about it now. He'd play a sort of like, you know, he'd have, he'd have the accent spot on, and he'd just be this brooding. Oh, I, I think he'd play it quite dark. Yeah, very dark, like Ben Kingsley in Sexy Beast, but not as erratic. I think he'd lack the physical presence to do it, though. Don't you think he needs to have a certain broad shoulders, big chest, you know? No, I don't think guy. so, because you look at Reservoir Dogs and there's not that many broad-shouldered guys in that, is there? I could see them as brothers, uh, like him and, and Vic Vega, Michael Madsen. Mm. Yeah, 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 definitely. And, and I love Daniel Day-Lewis. He's He probably is my favorite actor of everybody out there wow okay uh -huh. good, good shout joe so we're uh, jewels so we've yeah. done your favorite movie and daniel day lewis is your favorite actor yep where do we go next i don't know i think job done isn't it mic drop is it or no no you, are you not going to do the rest of the cast joe i am uh so jules originally tarantino wanted lawrence fishburne to play jules um he also was looking at uh Charles S. Dutton and Eddie Murphy. And uh, the guy that uh, I, who auditioned, who was Paul the bartender, also auditioned for Jules too, but he didn't get it. But I, I think that was the perfect choice. Yeah. E. Uh, yeah. Mia Wallace, so people had auditioned Patricia Arquette, Angela Bassett, Halle Berry, Phoebe Cates, Joan Cusack, uh, Bridget Fonda, Melanie Griffith, Daryl Hannah. Virginia Madsen, Bridget Nielsen, Michelle Pfeiffer, Uma Thurman, Isabella Rosalini, Meg Ryan, Meg Tilly, Marissa Tomei, Deborah Winger, Robin Wright, Julie Louise Dreyfus turned it down because she was committed to Seinfeld. And uh, Jennifer Jennifer Aniston also turned the role down because of Friends. Wow. What's mad, what's mad though is this is his second feature film and yet he's able to attract basically half the Hollywood A-list to audition and be attracted to his that part. That's that's pretty staggering, isn't it? It shows you how impactful Reservoir Dogs would be and how much buzz and hype there must have been around Tarantino at the time. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Hmm, the fact I that can it see only Bridget... cost eight and a half million to make as well. Five million of that was, was spent on um, uh, the wages. So... Um, they weren't paid a huge amount of money. Um, I bet most of that was Bruce Willis as well, because he's the, probably mm. the biggest star, wasn't he, out of all of them? Yeah, definitely. I don't know if it's him, but I think a, you know a lot of his actors work for scale. I could be wrong, but because you know, um, they just want to be in his movies. Out of that list, I'm thinking Bridget Fonda and Michelle Pfeiffer doing a really good job. Mm. Yeah, out of that list. But anyway, do a couple uh, more characters. Marcellus Wallace. Uh, okay. Paul Weathers. Oh, yes. <laughs> that would be interesting to see. At this, at this point, this is one of those points where man goes, man looks blankly and I don't goes, know who that is. and then we just say, what do we, uh, how, how do you put it, Joe? We do it in unison. Follow Creed. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or if you like Predator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, son of a bitch. Where they both re arm wrestle at the start of Predator. Okay. Or air wrestle, as they say. So Pumpkin, uh, Nicolas Cage, John Cusack, Johnny Depp, uh, I think Gary Oldman, Christian Slater. All of those, all of them could work. Yep. Definitely. Gary yeah. Oldman. Gary Nick Oldman Cage, would though. Be my favorite. Nick yeah. Cage. I could see Nick Look. Cage, actually. Yeah. I could see him. Well, did you watch that? Did you watch that that interview I sent you on Wogan? Did you watch that on when I sent it on the WhatsApp? Yeah, I think right. I thought you said Nick Cave, you know the Australian singer, which <laughs> I, I was I was finding harder to picture. But yeah, Nick, Nicholas Cage, Nick Cage, yeah, that would make more sense. Uh, Honey Bunny, uh, Patricia Arquette, Phoebe Cates, uh, Bridget Fonda, Jennifer Jason Leigh, and Marissa Tomei were considered. Jennifer Jason Leigh, she's genuinely unhinged yeah so yeah that would have worked that would have worked well uh lance and jody courtney love and kirk, kirk cobain i heard this yes 
were, were both offered the role. Um, they Pick turned Cobain down. The, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, Pam Greer auditioned for Jody. Ellen DeGeneres <laughs> um, was considered. Never worked. No. Come round. Come leave the leave the character there for the moment. We'll come round and you can and you can do some more. Um, okay. Amanda, what have you got? The film contains two hundred and fifty six f bombs. <laughs> that hefty number isn't Tarantino's highest, because oh. in nineteen ninety two, Reservoir Dogs used it two hundred and sixty nine times. The film was the big F word winner of 1994, as no other film released that year even came close to that amount of profanity. He won the Palm d'Or for Pulp Fiction. We didn't mention this, but and uh, that's not that's not my trivia. It's not my. It's not means I go. It's not really, but something's got to be said for that. I mean, taking a film like that and coming back with the the greatest honor possibly from film film critics. Yeah, and the chairman of the jury that year, Clint Eastwood. So, uh, ah, very, right, okay. Very astute choice by, uh, yeah, who, who I think actually does know what he's on about when it comes to directors. So I think he yes, saw he the, does. Talent, the talent there. I, I'm, I'm layering that in as a free bonus bit of trivia because I only came armed with three pieces and I've now got two after him. I'm just used to my second, so there we go. That's oh, sauce. Yeah, well, we want to know and I should have been more organised, so it's fine. I'm just, uh, I'm just signalling now that I've got one thing left in my locker, and that's it. Well, I know I don't deserve. Let's hope it's not this. On this bonus pod. Um, the uh, Christopher Walken delivering the gold watch story. Um, there's a pause. There's a really dramatic pause, uh, which is great, and it's just full attention. And then he carries on with the story. It looks like that was a uh, intentional. No, he'd forgotten his lines. <laughs> but Tarantino left it in because he said that that was incredible. It's almost like you're trying to get the trying to get the flow back and it worked perfectly. So that's what that's what you see is left in the film. I think that's great. Christopher Walker is human. He forgot he forgot lines, but then there is a great unintentional moment. I did I did like that. Yeah, um, it's very good. That wasn't your gonna be your only one then, Dom, so at least you've got another. Yeah, now I've got another one, uh, which is when we talk about great 90s films, we think Pulp Fiction and the unanimous score of 10 across the board here. But another classic, and who knows, maybe it's in somebody's list to discuss on this season, is The Shawshank Redemption. Uh, and both films, the link between is that they both opened on the same date, uh, October the 14th, 1994, and were both nominated for seven Academy Awards to, together. But I think um, when I think of great 90s films, spoiler alert, I think both, well, Pulp Fiction definitely and Shawshank Redemption, pretty sure as well, would be in my top five. But yeah, just a little twist of fate there. Two great all time 90s films released on the same date in 1994. Mm. I don't know what it is, Mr. Mr. Oscar Bantz. But I'd, I'd forgotten that Pulp Fiction got that many nominations. Yeah, well, Oscars. it won for Best Original Screenplay. So, so Quentin Tarantino's never won Best Director Oscar, which is um, you know, controversial, and some would say uh, an oversight by the Academy. It, he has won a Best Original Screenplay on at least two or three occasions, including for this film. But yeah, everybody who went up, so John Travolta, Best Actor, didn't win. Uh, Samuel Jackson, uh, Uma Thurma, they were all nominated in there individual categories and there were some other uh, other ones as well but it was um Boris Gump that was 1994 that swept the boards really well that's well, the problem again with the academy is like they're a bunch of old people that are very sappy and like you said it, it was very controversial because it was like glorifying like a drug life and all that I think that that turned them off and they're like but you know we'll give it to like some sappy nice story about some special guy that you know but no, see, I, the, yeah. see the, the the thing about with the academy, just going off topic slightly, they were all young once, and obviously when they were young, it was a, you know it's the sixties and everything kicking in. Surely that must have had some sort of, you know, get fine. We we, we can sort of relate to it because I almost look at the academy picking films now. Would the academy now pick Forrest Gump, or would they pick Pulp Fiction? Probably neither, actually, because they'd probably both be offensive in. It, to them in, in certain ways. Um, the depiction of somebody with, you know, 
like that as a as a figure that has obviously disabilities and things like that. I don't know. Maybe that would get picked. Who knows? But I, I just think that we always give the excuse that the Academy is too fuddy duddy and they're too set in the ways and that they wouldn't entertain a film. That's I can't think of anything in the last few years that's won an Oscar that I really cared about. No, I think it, I think it has lost its um, impact. The reason I do reference it every so often isn't because I'm a devotee of how it works and the uh, outcomes that they come up with. I just think it's like a bit of a historical marker when you look back on any decade, the 50s, 60s, you know, whichever one, then, you know, what won best, mm. who won best actor, who won best director, what was best film, um, whether it was richly deserved or it was a travesty of a decision. There's kind of some interest there and it acts as like a bit of a, a benchmark. You can also almost look at them as being these kind of cultural... Um, stakes in the ground, you know, and this is a classic year, yeah, classic example. You know, Forrest Gump um, was, didn't win all those awards just on its own merits or lack of merits. Some would say it was because of what it symbolised and what it meant, particularly in America at that uh, at that time. And and so mm. therefore we yeah, view I'll it give you that. Yeah, yeah. through a more critical eye. But yeah, more recently, it's kind of independence. You know, some some obscure nonsense films that people can scarcely remember two or three years later. And then obviously, you know, without getting into all that. Kind of worms but some of the more political controversies that have happened and films perhaps getting nominated and actor nominations for victories happening based on factors other than merit um yeah it, it does undermine the credibility of it and, I, and i've kind of lost interest from about 2010 onwards perhaps but um mm. but yeah no, I, I still find it interesting to go revisit it which oh. is why i try and shoehorn it in at every opportunity absolutely your oscar but i think you'd have trouble doing oscar bants you know in the last 20 years but with what yeah. we're, we're with what we're playing with we've got a gold mine I mean, share share for Moonstruck. Come on, That's brilliant. Anyway, come Joe. on trivia. Yeah, <laughs> come on trivia. Um, getting back to the casting. So Just do another for... couple. I think we. Can oh well, no, well, there's Less only a tight. couple anyway. Winston, uh, Alec Baldwin, Warren Beatty, Danny DeVito, Michael Keaton, Al Pacino are all considered. Warren Beatty for my would be my vote for an alternative. Yeah, I agree. That's I think a good choice. Good. Yeah. Captain yeah, yeah. Coons is he Zed? Captain Coons? No, that's um Christopher Walken's character. The uh... oh, Captain Coons. Okay, sorry. Uh, Robert De Niro, Tommy Lee Jones, Sean Penn, uh, William Patterson, and yeah, Al Pacino. Sean Penn's but, too young. But Tommy Lee little... Jones, I think I could see. I mean, Walken yeah. just fucking nails it, doesn't he? Let's be honest. But um, yeah. But yeah, uh, I think Tommy Lee Jones would be second choice. Uh, Butch was written for Mickey Rourke. But he turned it down. <laughs> they they also looked at Matt Dillon and Sylvester Stallone. You know, uh, I think I think that's it. Oh, right. is that, uh, Sean Penn was considered for Zed. Yeah, that would work as well. Yeah, I suppose so. Stallone, Stallone though, can you imagine Stallone? I mean, let's just take a moment to consider that prospect. Would that that would be a car crash, or it'd be it'd work brilliantly. Mm. You yeah. played a boxer before, mm. right? Oh, we know you can do the fight <laughs> scenes, yeah, but uh, that wasn't even shown, was it? Okay. Um, Travolta didn't really inject Uma Thurman in that scene. That's shocking. <laughs> the infamous scene in which Mia Wallace is stabbed with a very necessary adrenaline shot was stressful enough. So Tarantino took off some of the pressure. The needle was inserted and then Travolta pulled it out. The scene was reversed in post-production, so it looks as if Vincent Vega really is plunging that syringe into her. Movie magic. That's oh. pretty cool. That is like that. Good. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um so John Travolta was on inside the actor's studio with the great James Lipton. Um, and he went into the, some of the difficulties that he had playing Vincent Vega, saying that the most challenging was how was he going to show the essence of being a heroin addict? Um, so never using the drug himself, Tarantino went, um, had Travolta research the character's addiction by speaking to a recovering heroin addict that Tarantino knew. So go and speak to him, go and do your research, go and find out. Travolta uh, basically asked his, his mate, how does it feel on heroin without actually using it? <laughs> That's the way that you find it out. Um, his mate explained, if you want to get to the bottom envelope feeling of that, get plastered 
utterly wasted on tequila and lie down in a hot pool. Then you'll have barely touched the feeling of what it might be like to be on heroin. Uh, Travolta then explained it was ecstatic to go home and tell his wife, Kelly Preston, that he was being told to research aspects of the character and he has to get plastered and lie in a hot pool. Uh, and what did she do? Um, she said, fine. And she lined them all up on the side of a hot tub and went and joined him in the hot tub. Didn't match in drink for drink, but basically he got absolutely wasted and basically, yeah. Uh, so she joined him uh, and she was happy to assist him with his research. Yeah, that, they're just playing around with it. Daniel Day-Lewis would have become a smackhead. Uh, yeah, yeah his, he would have just... Method, did, method yeah. acting uh, vibe, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's why he would have been a better choice of actor. Um, I do have a cheeky one just before I go to just, I don't know, Dom, I think you've used up, so I might use one of yours up where did you, did it, uh, Joe might know the answer to this one. When Mia orders the five, the famous $5 shake. So Steve Buscemi, Buddy Holly, uh, asks her if she wants it, Martin and Lewis or Amos and Andy. I know that. Do you do? Anyone yeah. else want to take a guess? I think that's probably too geeky and too probably us centric to get i I didn't i didn't understand the reference no okay so he's referring to two comedy duos dean martin and jerry lewis the jerry lewis we've covered on the king of comedy so two white men or the amos and andy show which had two black men so basically he's asking her does she want a vanilla shake or a chocolate shake yep I always, I didn't, I didn't know that until I looked at the trivia. I was like, I thought it was a style uh, of milkshake, but yeah, there we go. And um, I know you guys were not familiar with Jerry Lewis when we did King of Comedy, so he was the Lewis in that one. And also, if you look at the the celebrities that they had in the bar, like the people pretending to be these different characters, they were there too, mm-hmm. Martin and Lewis. They were at the bar, and there were two guys. It was Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Hmm. Mm. I've got one. Oh, right. The original theatrical poster is worth a lot of money. Okay. Not the one that you see now. So what's the original one then? Right. The first poster had Uma Thurman smoking not from a box of Red Apple cigarettes, which is Tarantino's fake brand in seen in many of his films, but from a box of Lucky Strike cigarettes. However, Miramax hadn't licensed usage rights from Lucky Strikes, which then threatened to sue. Rather than fight it, Miramax had all the posters returned, except those that survived, which are now commanding big money. Wow, oh, that's cool. That's I oh, like it. that. That's good. Mm. Yeah. Do you have one? Do you have one, Dom? Uh, I haven't got one of those uh, rare ones, but I think I did have the Pulp Fiction poster up on my wall when I was at university. So. I was 18 when this film came out and no, yeah, I'm in trivia. I <laughs> didn't have any more trivia. Um, no, I've, uh, I've shot my wad. Joan, I'm done. He also I'm... had the picture of the tennis player scratching her ass. The, the, the Bob, back Bob one. Bob Marley smoking a spliff. All, all the Everyone classic. had that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all the belters. Are you smoking a spliff? Bob Marley smoking a spliff. So Jules quote of Ezekiel 2517 was fictitious. That's not the quote that's in the Bible. Okay. How did it differ? I don't know exactly what the quote is, but it's actually an amalgam. I can't say that word. Like a, you can say the other one, amalgamation of different quotes from the Bible. But it's, I don't think it's, oh. any, it, it has nothing to do with the actual Ezekiel 25. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have, it's strongly, I, I don't know about this one, so I'm going to just put it out there because we can perhaps talk about it. It's strongly implied that Fabienne was pregnant with Butch's kid. Oh, that's because of her belly? She talked about looking herself in the mirror, picturing herself with a pot belly and how she, good she'd look with it. After having a shower, Fabienne goes to tell Butch something, but sees he's very much fast asleep and she sighs and goes, ah, never mind. The next morning, she talks about having a very large and unusual breakfast which is uncommon for a woman so petite who isn't pregnant. I don't know. Well, she wanted to get fat too. Yeah, well, 
that could be that she was pregnant and she hadn't told him. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's why she brought up the big belly thing because her belly was going to get bigger. To lead him into it, and then after yeah. a shower, she was going to talk to him, but he fell asleep. Right, last one then. Keep, keep it nice and tight. Who wants to take the last one? Well, I'll take one. Okay. Um, John Travolta actually turned down the role of Forrest Gump. That's not true. He did. That's not. That can't that be true. That is a great and, one. And when you. you and when you think about it, like he, it's possible he would have won best actor for that. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. John Travolta in that role. See, I just see it as Tom. You know, much as I bitch and moan about it, I just see it as Tom Hanks's role. It, I, I can't see anybody else in that role now. Um, mm. I might not like it. I might, you know, really not like it at all. But. I can, I can see how other people would like it and I can see how other people would get something out of it. So, but yeah, John Travolta. Mm. We'll discuss maybe. it one day. Yeah, maybe. I'm, great, I, am, great. I am sorely tempted to choose Forrest Gump, given the amount of times we've referred to it. Every single pod, we have a mini little discussion on that film. Why, why not just embrace it? Yeah. Well, don't because worry. it's the first time that we're dipping into the 90s. Don't have to go over, you know, you don't have to go overboard you know and and choose like oh great oscar winners and stuff like that so we can leave it until a later season maybe i don't know okay. but it's your choice it's your um yeah i won't be angry i'll be disappointed you might as well yeah you might as well say <laughs> it <laughs> something like that right nice one nice trivia everyone i think we're gonna like this splitting it up a little bit i think mm -hmm. it's pretty good yeah nice nice and short um dear viewers dear listeners Give us your feedback. Do, is this is this good? If you do, uh, a lovely review on your podcast provider of choice and a nice rating, hopefully up in the fives and the fours. Um, fives. And if fives. you watch fives, don't, well, don't go, don't you've got go to give them a choice. Four star reviews. Yeah, but it sounds desperate if you just go, oh, please give us a five star review. They might have gone. I'm not saying we beg for it. They might have gone. I love the podcast, but that Dom guy really gets on my nerves. And then says, so gives gives it four. If you leave a four-star review list out, I'm going to call you out on the pod. Yeah. <laughs> you won't know who they were. They're going to be like Superfan4752. Well, you're going to, I bet they can't Anything wait for your vitriolic uh, barrage of uh, verbal uh, intent. Anything less than five stars, and I'm putting you down as a Russian bot. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, way to, way to uh, it, it, you know. Uh, endear yeah, so, ourselves to our yeah, new uh, yeah. listeners. No, I do, I do apologise for insulting the listeners. Yes, Wh whatever you think is accurate. Yeah. Um, if... Yeah. Okay. Any any praise, particular praise for me, definitely goes goes very far. So yeah, that's great. Right. Okay. Well, we'll see you for train spotting. Um, if you didn't know, we were doing tra oh, not train spotting. Sorry, basic instinct. Why did oh, I think? Oh, we know where Charlie's is going to be. <laughs> no, no, that, no, that no. gets edited. That's it. That's does edited. get edited. It's fine. Anyway. Do join us for the next podcast uh, where we're doing Basic Instinct and looking forward to that. Really looking forward to that. Um, okay, so on that note, bye from the first ever trivia. Cheerio. See you. Bye. Little pip. Bye.